Hello, we are back at our conference and live on Facebook, so it's a pleasure to introduce you to David Corey, that well, is from Notre Dame, and he's going to talk, us, talk to us about Aquinas with a wonderful title that I'm going to read right now. Sorry for this kind of suspense. It is the obscure and hidden work of the vegetal soul in Thomas Aquinas. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah. How do we observe the work of the soul? Cognitive and volitional acts can be observed experientially, as we heard a little bit about, uh, by feeling those actions when we perform them. But how do we observe the acts of the nutritive soul? These acts of digestion, generation, and growth are not internally available which leaves the biologist or the student of nature to observe them from the outside. But what kind of observations are available from the outside? It's interesting that Aquinas recognizes that these acts of the vegetal soul are a special challenge for the student of nature for whom they are obscure and hidden, in a text that I'll share with you in a minute. But what is just as obscure and hidden as the vegetal operations themselves are why Aquinas calls them obscure and hidden. Since, they are, since very few readers bother to consider in any detail how these operations work. My goal here is to unpack the complicated structure of the nutritive operation as a model case of an operation of the vegetal soul. Nutrition is an act which surpasses the usual powers of nature, such that Aquinas says that their act is from the soul rather than from nature. So if we can learn how Aquinas thinks that we should study the nutritive act, we can learn how the biologist is supposed to observe an act so as to recognize that it proceeds from the soul rather than from nature. And the plan of the paper is as follows. After first presenting a basic account of nutrition, I will consider a few uh, ways of interpreting the, the key players in the operation, which are the food, the bodily heat, and the soul. Then I will argue that nutrition is a case of ordered causality and is in fact Aquinas' standard and paradigmatic case. Third, I'm going to show that despite being the standard case, there is a really unique and important feature about it, namely that the principal agent, the soul, is an internal rather than an external agent. And finally, I'm going to draw some conclusions for how the student of nature ought to approach his own experience in order to correctly understand it. So the facts of nutrition as Aquinas understands them, reported in a philosophically neutral way, are as follows. As the most basic of the soul powers, the vegetal power is found in every soul. The other operations of uh, the vegetal power, in addition to nutrition, are growth and generation. And following Aristotle, Aquinas distinguishes between nutrition, which is the breaking down, assimilation, and dis distribution of food, on the one hand, from growth, on the other, which is the resulting increase in quantity. Thus, in acts of nutrition and growth, there are three contributors, the soul, the heat, and the food. I'm leaving their causal roles del del deliberately vague for the moment. We'll come back to them in a second. When new food enters the body, it is broken down by the heat of the digestive organ. The vital heat is weaker than the heat of fire. That means uh, lesser in intensity, but qualitatively the same and has a similar consuming effect. Having been subjected to the heat, the food breaks down. And Aquinas compares this, process, uh, this processing of food to cooking. This is text one in your handout. Uh, he says, it is necessary that all food must be cooked because it comes to be in a certain way through fire, once fire is in a certain way operative in nutrition and consequently in growth, but not as a principal agent, for this is the soul, but rather as a secondary and instrumental agent. Whatever cooking does not get done outside of the body has to happen inside during nutrition. As the food breaks down, it becomes more like the body, and once it's sufficiently like the body, the heat diffuses it uh, to the relevant parts of the body, and once that, uh, once the sort of um, body-like food is distributed to the relevant parts, it's assimilated to the body. Uh, and this results sometimes in sort of mere nutrition and then sometimes goes on to result in growth. Um, of themselves, the elemental qualities are inadequate to serve as the active principles for vital operations. For Aquinas, the evidence that the soul as opposed to mere heating is the principle of nutrition is that the nutritive heating does not only consume or break down the food, but also does the assimilation work and the uh, transmitting work, distribution work. Um, likewise, in the case of growth, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's helpful just to have this part of the picture, the soul's influence is evident in the fact that growth proceeds only up to a certain limit. 
Since an animal or plant only grows to a certain size, there must be an internal limit on its active growth. This limit can't come from the heat, uh, since, uh, uh, since fire of its own nature just continues to consume things until it runs out of fuel. Um, in both nutrition and growth, the elemental qualities and heat in particular serve as instruments of the soul. Um, bodily fire, Aquinas often has this, he has this theory of virtual presence, so he often talks as though fire is present in the body. Bodily fire has to act in virtue of the soul, and its proper action must be limited by, by the soul. This is text two and three on your handout. I decided it was so important that I'd print it twice. Sorry about that. <laughs> what is principal in any action is that by which the terminus in nature is imposed on it. This is clear in artificial beings because the terminus or nature of a box or a house is not imposed by the instruments, but from the art itself. For the instruments are related differently as cooperating uh, with this form uh, or quantity or that one. For a saw as such is fit to the cutting of wood, either for a door or a bench or a house, and in whatever quantity. But that the wood be thusly cut, that it be fit to such a form and to such a quantity, belongs to the power of the artist. But it is clear that in everything according to nature there is a certain limit and a determinate proportion of magnitude and, and growth. Therefore, that which is the cause of the determination of magnitude and growth is the principal cause of growth. This, however, cannot be the fire, for it is clear that, in, that the growth of fire um, does not extend to a determinate quantity, but extends uh, infinitely, if there is uh, infinite matter for the combustion to be found. It is therefore clear that fire is not the principal agent in growth and nutrition, but rather the soul is. And this is reasonably granted, for the determination of quantity in natural things is the form which is the specific principle rather than, uh, rather than the matter. It's from the form rather than from the matter. Now the soul is related to the elements which are in the body of a living organ as form is to matter. Therefore the terminus and the magnitude and growth is from the soul rather than from the fire. So, just to use an example, when a robin eats some bird seed, it's the robin's soul responsible for the heat's ability to carry, carry the whole process beyond mere destruction of food and to result in assimilation and growth. Um, so far I've said that the food and the heat act as instruments, but what more precisely are the causal relationships that link the bird's soul, the heat, and the food? One quite tempting way to uh, analyze the narrative, particularly for modern readers of Aquinas, would be to portray it as a kind of mechanistic picture. Taking such an approach, one might think of the soul, the heat, and the food as complementary causes in the same order, working together, each performing its own act. Each of these acts would be one in a series of distinct efficient causes, and each agent of the chain would act on the next. Under such an account, the soul would start the series by causing the heat, acting as a kind of furnace cum thermostat, to, so as to induce just the right amount of heat into just the right part of the body. The heat would in turn perform its own act on the food, breaking down the food and making it more like the body and carrying it to the relevant parts of the body. Finally, the body, like food, would act on the body by fusing itself to the body. Apparent support for reading Aquinas' account of nutrition in this way might be found in at least two contexts. I'll only mention the first one briefly. The first is that the repeated claim that the soul integrates or holds together the body's diverse parts suggests that the soul works on the conjoined instrument, the fire, from the outside. But even stronger, more interesting support for this kind of interpretation would be drawn from those texts in which Aquinas asked two related questions of whether the soul is united to the body through a medium and whether the soul is found in every part of the body. His professed view on the matter is that although qua form, the soul is equally in every part of the body, Qua mover, it moves, it moves a, specific, a, a very specific part of the body, which then in turn moves all the other parts. Namely, the soul is particularly present to the heart, which is in turn the source of all the rest of the bodily motion. On this point, his most startling remark comes in his short Opusculum De Mortu Cordis, where he first cites and then glosses Aristotle's comparison in De Mortu Animalium between the soul and a ruler. According to the comparison, the soul is like a ruler of a well-governed kingdom, in which the ruler need not directly control everything that goes on within his kingdom, uh, but rather depends on each of the subjects performing his own role according to custom and law. Aquinas endorses the comparison of the ruler to the heart and indicates that the soul moves the body insofar as it moves the heart. And he says, and I don't think that, this is not on your handout, but it's just a short 
Uh, he says, so also therefore the motion of the heart is natural as though following upon the soul insofar as it is the form of such a body and principally of the heart. So at least with respect to the body's motion, the soul is somehow closer to one of the parts than it is to the, uh, the rest of them, right? Namely the heart. And it moves the rest of them through intermediaries like this ruler of the, of the kingdom. Now, um, the reason that these texts seem to support the mechanistic readings is that they can be construed to mean that the soul acts in the same order of efficient causes as the fire and the food. In such a picture, the soul's role would be as an igniter and regulator of bodily fire, although through a series of intermediaries, of course. Now, were this Aquinas' view, his theory of the soul would be open to some well-deserved deflationary critique. On such a reading, the soul would serve as a crude plug for the missing mechanism for, uh, for the regulation of various bodily instruments, turning on the heat, moving the heart. Crucially, since its act would belong to the same order as the agents of the, the with, as the agents, uh, the fire and the food, its priority over those other agents would come merely from being the first in the sequence. In other words, this mechanistic construal of nutrition makes the soul the first in a series of same order causes, moving the instrumental causes the way an engine moves a car. Under such a theory, the soul is at best a theoretically awkward initial mover, positive to fill gaps in an account of bodily motion. At worst, it is an unnecessary addition to an already complete, if not completely understood, biological account. If the soul moves the body in the same way that one part moves the next, it seems likely that whatever one attributes to the soul could be better explained by yet by some yet undiscovered aspect of bodily motion. We just need more empirical inquiry, right? So to avoid the shortcomings of this mechanistic construal of the relationship between the soul, the food, and the fire, one might be tempted to sort of jump in the opposite direction towards the second causally reductivist construal located at the other end of the interpretive spectrum, according to which non-human souls don't have any interesting causal role to play over and above the mechanisms of the body. A defender of such an interpretation would downplay or deny the soul's role as motor of the body by interpreting uh, what Aquinas says about animal and plant souls as just not having anything to do with causality in this way. And this is the view of interpreters like Sheldon Cohn, Eleanor Stomp, Robert Pagnow, who insists that um, Aquinas' theory of animal and plant souls and operations is compatible with a materialistic account of animals and plants. As Pazna puts it, with the exception of the human soul, Aquinas' theory presents a theory of, uh, quote, soul and other forms in a way that a modern materialist could readily welcome, end quote. Interestingly, Aquinas himself acknowledges that it is tempting to in interpret plant activity in this sort of bottom-up way, i.e. to ignore the causal role of the soul in nutrition and growth and generation. And this is text four in the handout, and it's kind of the, the, the money text that I get the title from. Uh, Aristotle shows that the work of the vegetative powers are from the soul, which was necessary, i.e. it was necessary for Aristotle to make this extra, you know, demonstration. Because since the active or passive qualities contribute to their operations, it may seem to someone that they are from nature and not from the soul. And it is especially so because in plants, life is obscure and hidden. So I want to shed some light on, what, on this obscurity and hiddenness. The, the contrast here is between an action of the soul and an action of nature. And by nature, he has in mind something that works by means of the active and passive elemental qualities. He's, Aquinas is elsewhere clear that he subscribes to Aristotle's view that the immediate principles of, of alteration, generation, and corruption of the sublunary, sublunary world are these elemental qualities, right? The heat, the cold, the moist, and the dry. So because heat is operative all the way through the act of digestion and because there is no other active principle or observable mechanism at work except for heat, it is easy to arrive at the false conclusion that all the stages of digestion are explicable exclusively in terms, in terms of heat. So much for what Aquinas does not hold. What then is his own view? I argue that it, his view is what might be called an ordered agent view or an ordered causality view. Namely, that the soul and its instruments are related to each other as primary and secondary agents. Ordered causation is a kind of causation in which an effect is produced by more than one agent, of which, one of which is the primary and the other is secondary, and uh, together these agents perform a single act in the manner of a single cause. The relationship between the two ordered causes is stronger than that between two non-ordered causes, which are merely neighboring members in a chain of efficient uh, causes. 
So that is, the, the sculptor is related to his chisel more intimately than a forest fire is related to the trees that it burns, uh, or one tree to the next, right? This relationship between the two agents, I will argue, allows the ordered agent view to satisfy two desiderata lacking in the two accounts just given. It allows the soul to be sort of a real contributor to the action, and it also denies that the soul is a contributor. It'll allow Aquinas to deny that the soul is a contributor in the same order as the other bodily parts, like the heat of the fire. Now, as I said, in the ordered agent account, two or more agents act together to perform a single act. One of these is principal, and the others are instrumental. Um, because they act together towards a single end, there's a certain degree of unity that pertains between the two agents. And Aquinas says the principal agent and the instrumental agent are in a certain way one when one acts through the other. So Aquinas' language here is measured. The two acts are act as a single cause, quasi una causa, indicating that the powers of both agents uh, work together even though the two agents remain distinct. In our case of nutrition, this means that the robin soul and the heat of its digestive system are, uh, are sort of one, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but they're not two distinct uh, sequential efficient causes. Uh, so although uh, ordered agents produce a single effect, the principal and the instrumental agent each can uh, contribute something different to the effect. So, so where the unity comes in is, is, is in the effect. Where the distinctness comes in is the fact that there's more than one agent. Right? Aquinas distinguishes their contributions from each other in two ways. So even though the effect is one, you can see two different sort of dimensions of the effect. Sometimes he compares the two contributions to form and matter, and sometimes he compares them to ends and means. In De Veritate 14.5, which is text 5 in your handout, uh, Aquinas is considering whether charity is the form of faith, and he gives this form-matter comparison. He says, for whenever there are two principles ordained to one another in motion or in action, that which is in the effect, is, uh, that which is in the effect from the superior agent is, as it were, formal, and that which is from the lower agent is, as it were, material. Although the context here is theological, Aquinas applies the distinction broadly, and is part of his general theory of how motion and action work. In fact, the very same passage sets up the nutritive soul and its instruments as the standard case, surprise, surprise, to which he compares other analogous cases of ordered causality in text 6. For in the act of the nutritive potency, the power of the soul is, as it were, the primary agent. But fiery heat is, as it were, the instrumental agent, as is said in two de anima. But in flesh generated through nutrition, that which is from the heat of fire, namely the aggregation of parts or the dryness or something of this sort, is material with respect to the species of flesh, which is from the power of the soul. Here, as in other passages, the soul's bringing about a flesh is a paradigmatic case of ordered principles co-causing a single effect. The fiery heat performs the usual aggregative function of heat, which brings light together. I should mention that that's the, the function of heat given by Aristotle and De Generatione and Corruptione, right? That, that uh, fire brings uh, light together. Of course, cold, cold aggregates uh, dissimilar things, right? Um, the properly arranged matter, in this case, aggregated presumably into homogeneous material, since fire is bringing light together, right? receives its arrangement in virtue of the heat, and receives the species of flesh in virtue of the soul. So these two contributions are distinguished. The reason why the primary agent's contribution is formal is that it specifies the end, and hence determines what is produced, and thereby also what kind of act is being performed. Thus Aquinas also distinguishes the principal and the instrumental agents as that which contributes the end and that which contributes the means, respectively. And that's text 7, and I won't read the whole thing. Um, it's, it's the same idea, but put in terms of means and ends. Um, um, so uh, you, can, you can look at that if you want. Even though heating occurs as part of digestion, the production of flesh rather than heating is the terminus of the act, since it is... Excuse me. It is, it is the likeness of the agent, e.g. a dog, rather than the agent's instrument, e.g. a dog's heat, which is produced. The point here is empirically grounded. The effect of the heat outside the body, the unrestricted heat of fire, right, if you, had, if you just had a fire burning, is to dissolve and disintegrate whatever it acts upon. 
But bodily heat, as the instrument of the soul, produces a different effect. It produces flesh. Because the dog's heat results in dog flesh rather than in fire, fire is clearly not the principal agent. We can now see why the end specifying agent is the primary agent. In Contra Gentiles 289, Aquinas explains the nutritive power by making an unattributed use of Proposition 1 of the Liber de Causis. Uh, and this is going to be text 8. Um, that, that proposition states that the, that the first cause has a stronger effect, plus et influence, a uh, stronger effect than the second cause. He says, if they are ordered to one another, and he's talking about the two causes here, it is necessary that there is one effect of them. For the first causing agent acts in the second agent's effects more strongly than the second agent itself. Whence we see that an effect which is brought about through an instrument by a principal agent is more properly attributed to the principal cause than to the instrumental. For it happens sometimes that the action of the principal agent achieves something in the operation that is not achieved in the action of the instruments, as when the vegetative power produces the species of flesh, to which the heat of fire, which is its instrument, is not able to lead, although it is at work in, dis in disposing of it by dissolving and consuming. I just really love this use of the Liber de Causis to to explain the nutritive principle from the De Anima. It's just, just really, it's really elegant. We saw above that the principal cause determines the effect, i.e. that a dog is produced rather than a heat. Uh, here Aquinas sort of gives a reason for that principle, which is that the primary agent's effect is stronger than that of the secondary agent. It's got sort of more control over the action. But despite this greater strength, the two aren't really in competition with each other, but rather uh, cooperatively at work. In cases such as nutrition, the principal agent is strong enough that it makes the fire perform an act to which the fire is not able to perform on its own, but it doesn't make it do an unfire like thing. I'm going to come back to that idea in a second. But Aquinas makes this point even more explicit in Contra Gentiles 3 149, which is text 9. The instrumental agent does not dispose to the perfection included, induced by the principal agent, except insofar as it acts by the power of the principal agent. For the heat of fire does not prepare the matter to be the form of flesh any more than any other form, except insofar as it acts by the power of the soul. Uh, this last sentence is really striking. The effect of fiery heat on its own would be no closer to bringing about the form of flesh than to bringing about any other form. You really need the soul to be doing something, um, which sheds light on what we saw in the previous text, right? It's, it's, it happens that the action of the principal agent achieves something in its operation which is not achieved through the action of the instrument. The instrument is just insufficient to, to, doing, to, to doing this. Crucially, however, there are limits to the extent to which the principal agent can enhance the power of its instrument. Uh, um, this is text 8. Uh, Aquinas says that the, the principal agent can't really override, or text 10, I'm sorry, the principal agent can't override the instrumental agent's native powers. It's got to use them in a way that's co-natural to the instrument's own powers. So he says, every instrumental agent accomplishes the action of the principal agent through some action that is proportionate and co-natural with it. Just as heat by nature generates flesh by the dissolving and dividing, uh, and the saw is used to the perfection of the stool by cutting. Thus, although the soul can enhance the power of fire, it can't make fire just do anything. Um, the direction by the principal agent doesn't compromise or alter the secondary agent. In other words, the kind of causality which the substantial form exercises over its accidents, if the accidents are indeed instruments of the substantial form, is not in competition with the causal integrity of those accidents. En contraire, like any primary agent, the soul depends on its instrument having exactly the active powers it does, just like the sculptor depends on the chisel having exactly the active powers it does for, in order to call, carve the sculpture. Thus, the action of both agents is discernible in the effect, but in different respects. Um, and... Um, the, and, and also the, the instrument has to be suitable. Aquinas defends the need for having a suitable instru uh, instrument with this interesting reductio argument in text 11 on your handout, where he says, uh, it is necessary for every effect, which is something proceeding through an instrument from an efficient cause, to be proportioned to the instrument as well as to the effect. For we cannot use any instrument whatsoever just for any cause. 
whence it is not possible to come to be through some instrument to which the action of the instrument in no way extends. You couldn't do the digestion through cooling instead of heating if you just didn't have any bodily heat, right? You'd be frozen. All right. Aquinas' theory of ordered causality clearly sets his theory of nutrition apart from the reductivist view I presented above, in which the soul uh, has no clear causal role and the instruments do all the work. Uh, it's clear that the soul has to sort of enhance the instruments. But, and I've made a little headway maybe against the mechanistic interpretation above, inasmuch as the soul is not a cause in the same order as the other instruments, but it might be objected that Aquinas' theory is still left with a more subtle version of the problems of the mechanistic interpretation. If you recall, the core problem with the mechanistic interpretation was that the soul seemed to serve as kind of a crude plug used to fill this explanatory gap. Well, Aquinas nominally escapes this problem by holding that the soul and its instruments belong to distinct orders. His analogies to God and the soul in the case of grace and to the sculpture and the chisel in the case of artifice seem to suggest that the soul exercises causal influence on the body as though it were an agent distinct from it. The sculptor's power over the chisel is easy to understand because the, precisely because the two are distinct substances. And the interface mechanism by which the former affects the latter is relatively clear. So one might object that Aquinas um, uh, um, certainly can't wish to conceive of the soul along similar lines as a distinct uh, 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 separate substance or something like this. But we shouldn't be misled by the analogies to uh, here. The nutritive power of the soul is only like God or the sculptor in the following way. Since it is the primary agent that both formally determines the effect and gives the secondary agent the power to achieve it, the act is attributed or credited to the principal agent rather than the instrumental agent. That's the point Aquinas is trying to make. Just as the smith, rather than the hammer, is the maker of the dagger, so the soul, rather than the heat, is the true source of digestion. But these analogies should not be taken to, uh, further to suggest that, in the case of nutrition, the soul di directly acts on something extrinsic to itself. Instead, the soul and its conjoined instrument, the heat, I argue, constitute a special case of ordered causality, in which the principal agent gives being to its instrument in a sorry, in which the principal agent gives being to its instrument. I want to emphasize that. Uh, in, in, a way that uh, the, in, in a way that the form gives being. Since as a substantial form, the soul is constitutive of the parts of the body, including the active qualities like heat and cold and moist and dry, it causes those parts to have their being. But so the soul does not tamper or alter with the causal powers of its instruments, it does influence their character, and in fact, in an even more fundamental way, namely by causing them to exist in their specific manner in the first place. Put succinctly, the substantial form does not affect its instruments, but rather affects them. Aquinas makes this claim repeatedly. In Questionis Disputata de Anima 9, he says that the soul immediately gives substantial and specific existence to all the parts of the body. But even more striking and colorful expressions are when Aquinas contrasts the soul with artificial forms like the form of the house. I'll skip text 12 and read text 13 because it's shorter and they both say very similar things. In De Spiritualibus Creaturis, he says, the form of the house, because it is accidental, does not give specific existence or esse specificum to the several parts of the house as the soul gives to each part of the body. Um, so an animate body is unlike a house exactly in that the soul informs uh, each of the parts and not just the whole. The kind of, uh, and, and the, the accidental form of the house is really just the form that sort of binds these pre-existing parts together. The kind of unity that uh, forms of artifacts bestow on art artificial substances takes advantage of the, ten of the tendencies that each of the parts has in virtue of its own substantial form. The soul, by contrast, is responsible for the tendencies not only of the whole, but also of the several parts. Moreover, it makes the parts to be as they are with a view towards the good of the whole. Again, the soul is not like the form of the house in that it does not unify pre-existing parts. Rather, it gives unity and being to the parts themselves as well as to the whole to which those parts are directed. The soul uses the heat of the instrument while also giving, its, while also giving that instrument its specific existence. So under Aquinas' account of nutrition, then, the soul directs the body as a principal cause uh, to an instrument, but without being external to it. 
And giving each part of the body its existence, the soul is responsible for the specific diversity of parts, including the active qualities, which are the immediate instruments of vegetal operations. It neither manipulates those qualities into doing something other than what they would do by their own nature, nor does it merely ride atop those qualities as a marker of uh, substantial identity. Rather, it makes the parts to be what they are, and in so doing, ordains them to one another and to the good of the whole. In sum, Aquinas' account of bodily activities is neither top-down nor bottom-up. It is inside-out. Right? Um, so, conclusion. The complex structure of the nutritive act has important implications for how the student of nature can observe it. As I said at the outset, Aquinas recognizes that the operations of the vegetal soul are obscure and hidden, even more so than the operations of sensitive and intellectual souls. That was text four, in case you wanted to, to see it again, right? Or I'll, I should actually read it again because it's relevant to what I'm about to say. Uh, Aristotle shows that the works of the vegetal soul are from the soul, which is necessary because the active and passive qualities contribute to their operations. Uh, because it may seem to someone that they are from nature and not from the soul. And it is especially so because in plants, life is obscure and hidden. The point is not exactly that nutrition and other vegetal acts are just harder to understand. Rather, it is this, that when we observe them, what we immediately observe are the same active principles that we find in the operations of inanimate bodies, right? Of the, el of the elements and of the inanimate mixed bodies. In other words, the search for the active principles by which nutrition happens leads to the elemental qualities, hot, cold, moist, and dry, and thus inexorably ends up analyzing or breaking down the observed activity in a kind of reductive way that we were talking about earlier. As a result, an empirical approach to nutrition seems to lead the biologist towards a mechanistic account, away from the soul rather than towards it. But as we have seen, Aquinas thinks it is merely difficult, but not impossible, to arrive at the true character of nutrition as an act of the soul, which transcends the elemental powers, and even, although I can't explain the point here, even transcends the potency of matter, in some limited sense. How are we supposed to arrive at these more difficult conclusions? What's the student of nature supposed to do right, to, get, to get there? Well, the first step is that the student of nature, the biologist, must not understand nutrition only in terms of a series of microprocesses, like heating and cooling. Rather, those processes must be understood in terms of the act as a whole. To account for nutrition completely, it is not sufficient merely to observe the elemental active and passive principles at work, but one must also explain how their, con how their activities contribute to the larger explanandum, i.e. the replenishment of the body, the production of flesh, and growth. This is the point of his argument in Tu De Anima and his commentary, that nothing inanimate is properly fed. This is why he's really hung up on this point, right? The tough case he has to explain is fire, which seems to be fed by the fuel it burns. Aquinas says that this description is due to the intensity of the active principle, uh, which is very, very good at consuming what it encounters, right? But crucially for his analysis of nutrition, he says that the growth of fire is only apparent growth. He says, if some wood is newly ignited, the previous fire in the other wood, wood that's already burning is not preserved through this ignition. For the whole fire, which is from an amalgamation of many flames, is not one simpliciter, but is clearly one by aggregation, like a heap of stones is one, and on account of such a unity has a certain similitude to nutrition. End quote. It's not really nutrition, it just looks like it. The important point, the important move here is how Aquinas parses the two phenomena. The growth of the fire and the self-nourishing of a living body are not the same kinds of phenomena, even at the level of the explanandum. Right. The nourished body is a single thing to which many parts contribute, while well, the fire is not a substantial unity acting towards the good of the whole, but rather an aggregate of many substances, which only seem to act towards a single good, insofar as every part produces a similar effect as every other part. My point here is that it's not, it's not just that it's important to study the whole in addition to the parts, but that once the biologist focuses on the whole, even his study of the parts is transformed. As just one example of how this plays out in Aquinas' soul theory, and, and there's many others, but this is very interesting, consider his claim that the soul is, a more, is more noble and more powerful to the extent to which it informs a greater diversity of parts. It's a really fascinating principle. Uh, and this is from De Spiritualibus Creaturis 4, and unfortunately you don't have this text, so I'll read it slowly. In those corruptible things, imperfect forms which are weaker in power, 
have fewer operations for which the dissimilarity of parts is not required, as is clear in inanimate bodies. But a soul, since it has a higher uh, and more powerful, since it is a higher and more powerful form, is able to perf to be a principle of diverse operations, the execution of which requires dissimilar parts of the body, and therefore every soul requires a diversity of organs. Uh, in the parts of the body to which the act belongs. And the greater the diversity, the more perfect the soul will be. And therefore the forms of lower things perfect their matter uniformly, but souls perfect their matter in multiform ways, such that the integrity of a body whose first act is primarily in per se a soul is constituted from dissimilar parts. So just as important as the mechanisms are the realization that an animal with a greater diversity of parts brings more operations under a single principle. In other words, an animal with greater bodily complexity has, at a, at a sort of deeper level of analysis, a greater unity, uh, paradoxically, since its single soul is able to ordain a greater array of bodily operations towards a single end, right, towards the good of the animal. And the biologist will never be able to understand the true nature of the several operations if he is never able to understand them with reference to the life of the whole. The upshot for the student of nature is that on Aquinas' view, it is not sufficient to identify the correct active principle or mechanism. The student of nature must give an account of how this principle contributes to the specific act uh, under investigation. That act has to be well described. Bell just can't get away with observing the heat alone and be done with sort of finding the, the active principle, but has to understand that heating in relation to nutrition, he has to maintain the perspective of the whole even while he analyzes the parts. Uh, and once he does so, it becomes, among other things, clear that the heating contributes to the nutrition merely instrumentally, right? And all these other kind of more interesting metaphysical principles about the soul follow as well. So with that, I'll stop and see if you have any questions. Thank you very much, David. It was fascinating, and especially right now that we are going to have our land so <laughs> think about nutrition and tempting. I'm sure Sorry to distract you. No, no, no. no, no was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. I guess there will be many questions again online for you who are watching us on Facebook. If you have any question, you can.